As always, I'm thankful for the opportunity to deliver a sermon to you. It's always a pleasure for me to do so. If you would, be turning to the book of Luke, the third chapter of that book. We'll be making some opening remarks about this chapter, and then we'll read a few verses from it. Luke chapter 3. We see that this chapter begins with a telling of local of the local political atmosphere by listing those in power there in verse 1. Then the scope narrows a little and it points out those chief priests among the Jews verse 2 and then the writer points out it is during this time that John the baptizer the forerunner of the Christ begins his work the latter part of verse 2 it then points out where he began his work and even shows his message verse 3 It then points out that he is fulfilling prophecy as found in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 through 5. Which would then bring us to our text. So again Luke chapter 3 verse 4 and we'll read through the first part of verse 8. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. So this morning I would like for us to consider three things from particularly verse 8. What exactly is repentance? What is the significance of the phrase worthy of? And third, what is implied by the phrase bring forth fruit? So what is repentance? Well the word translated repent comes from the Greek term metanoio which literally means afterthought this term suggests the concept of one thinking about a deed after the commission of it in the in the case of any sinful act the idea would be that a review of that act the one sinning would be considering their action And then they would have a feeling of sorrow for having committed said sin. But repentance is not merely an emotion of feeling sorry, feeling sorrow. You know, we went to Huntsville yesterday, many of us did, to have our fall fellowship. Huntsville has several prisons, no doubt full of people who feel sorry about getting caught for what they did. Repentance is not feeling sorry for getting caught. True repentance includes sorrow for committing the act itself. It also includes the resolve of the one committing it to cease from the wrongful conduct and replacing that conduct with godly living. Matthew chapter 12 verses 43 through 45 as was Luke chapter 11 verses 24 through 26 (laughs) Joseph H. Thayer comments regarding repentance as follows repentance is the change of mind of those who have begun to abhor their errors and misdeeds and have determined to enter upon a better course of life so that it embraces both a recognition of sin and sorrow for it, and hearty amendment, the tokens and efforts of which 
our good deeds. So it is obvious that true repentance entails so much more than mere remorse for one's past conduct. We see an example of this in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The Jews of that day were charged, and rightfully so, with the murder of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Peter there says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. They were charged with murdering the very Son of God. Now reasoning with this fact, they came to the conclusion. Eventually they asked the question. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Thus indicating their, their resolve that they believed in Christ. And Peter answered them, Verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, they were convicted. They knew that they had done wrong, but they needed to know what to do from there. They were told to repent. Obviously, they felt some amount of sorrow. We'll discuss the different levels of sorrow as we progress through this lesson. But another instance in, in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 through 19, we've talked a little bit about it in Bible class. Again, Acts chapter 19, verse 18 and 19, which says, Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Obviously, they had repented. They were sorrowful for the sins that they had committed, that is, witchcraft during the day. And they wanted to make sure that they were able to make things right. Thus, they burned their books, never to use them again. Furthermore, on the, the point of repentance needing more than just remorse, Paul later points out to the Corinthian brethren in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, Now I rejoice that not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's a difference between feeling sorry for your actions, and then, then there's true repentance, wanting to do something about it. Secondly, what is the significance of the expression, worthy of? Again, Luke chapter 3, first part of verse 8. This expression, worthy of, comes from the Greek word, axios. Originally, this term was employed to point out things of similar weight, objects of similar weight. It is used in the New Testament in a metaphorical sense. And it can be used for both good and bad things. When you consider our currency, the dollar, and you compare it to precious metals, as of last night I looked, one ounce of pure silver will fetch $26.40. One ounce of pure gold 
will bring $1,826.55. That's a big difference. So you can easily say that one ounce of silver is worthy of $26. One ounce of gold is worthy of a little over $1,800. So in the sense of Christian living, we must do things that are worthy of the gospel, that carry the same weight. When we consider examples of this expression, worthy of, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 10, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 11, these passages point out that those who would spend their time laboring and to preach the gospel are worthy of monetary support. We would typically refer to that as a located preacher. When they spend their, their time, their lives, <laughs> preaching the gospel, God says they deserve a paycheck. Then we see that when someone commits a murder... They are worthy of death. Paul points out in Acts chapter 23 verse 29 that he was not worthy of death, but if he was, he refused not to die. Acts chapter 25 verse 11, again, pointing out that if he was worthy of death, due to the crimes of, of sin, he, he would accept that. But he knew that he wasn't. He even stated that. Romans chapter 13 verse 4 points to government having the God-given obligation and right to execute him that doeth evil. Now certainly governments of man can, can determine wrongfully what that evil would be. Obviously the evil must be in light of the scriptures. Especially in Texas, we have the death penalty. If someone murders someone else, they are worthy of death. And the government has the right and the obligation to execute that individual. When you consider the Old Testament, we have similar examples. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 21... In dealing with false witnesses, there it's recorded in verse 16, If a witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from, you, from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And then I shall have, have no pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. If the wrongdoer is guilty, they deserve just punishment. If the false witness is determined to be a false witness, they're just as guilty. The severity of sin is shown in verse 21. A life for a life, an eye for an eye. We know from Leviticus chapter 17 verses 13 and 14 that eating blood was forbidden. We can see from Leviticus chapter 20, verses 10 through 13, that bestiality and adultery were both forbidden. Leviticus chapter, 10, verse, or chapter 20, verses 10 through 13. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. 
And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his, uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man lie also with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Thou shall surely be put to death, and their blood shall be upon them. Does this sound like anything we have to deal with in this country? Just about everything we just read occurs on a regular basis. Now, under the old law, those individuals, both parties, participating parties, were worthy of death. Now, obviously, they died spiritually, and there is a remedy, as we will discuss later. Thankfully, for most of the country and most of the world, we don't live under the old law. Otherwise, there would be a whole lot less people out. We know from Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, that God required the death of murderers. He there told Noah, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. That's how important it is to God. Mankind has been made in the image of God, and anyone who would shed that blood is worthy of death. Speaking of the guilty Gentiles, Paul points out in Roman, Romans chapter 1, verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense, of their error which was meet or worthy. So you see, those who would practice any form of homosexuality deserve punishment. Under the old law, they were to be put to death. Under the law of Christ, they still die spiritually, but they also deserve the things that come about this type of lifestyle. You think of the various diseases that these people face because of their fornication. Homosexuality is not limited to that. Those who would have premarital sex and extramarital sex are all subject to the due recompense. Not only spiritual death, but also physical diseases. Ultimately, all sin deserves death, separation from God. In contrast, faithfulness to God brings eternal life. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Which either, with each of these accounts in mind, the change of life must or is characteristic of repentance and it must correspond to the severity and nature of the offense. You see, when one man is murdered, his murderer is deserving of death. If there are other sins that are committed, as we progress, we'll point those out, there are different punishments. The punishment must fit the crime, and with God, it always will. It always has. Now, if these terms have not been met, true repentance has simply not occurred. Third and final, what is implied by the phrase, bring forth fruit? Just what is meant by the actual fruit required in genuine repentance? Well, if a sin has been committed against another person or people, repentance must occur with that person or people in addition to God. You see, when any sin is committed, ultimately it's committed against God. 
from that point forward, we must determine who, other, who, al- who else is affected by that sin that we commit. David confessed to Nathan that he had sinned against God. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. While correct in this conclusion, this statement, it is absurd to conclude that he had no responsibility to acknowledge this sin with Bathsheba. After all, it was her husband that he had murdered to cover up their adulterous affair. Obviously, King David needed to remedy things to the best of his ability with Bathsheba. Otherwise, true repentance would not have occurred. Far too many live under the illusion that they can make confession before the church without making things right personally with those they've committed sin against, the victims of their sin. Furthermore, one cannot secretly repent of a sin while subsequently denying that that sin had ever occurred. When one commits a sin, we must consider who all has been involved. Is the sin only between you and God? That's where it must end. Take care of it between you and God. No one else needs to know. Did you sin against another? Of course, God knows about it. You must then resolve it between you three. Did you sin against a large party, going beyond what you might realize? I had heard an illustration several years back where a father attempting to teach his son about repentance told his son to take this bag of feathers and place a feather at every doorstep in the town. Being an obedient son, he did so. He came back and said, Father, I've placed all those feathers. They were so led, the father tells him, now go get all the feathers. Sometimes we might, we might not know how far our sin can reach others. Certainly we must make it right with those who we know it contacted. But at that point, we must make public con- uh, confession before the church. Because what happens if somebody that was affected by it, whatever sin it might be, and they come back and they say, oh, well, whoever you call brother so-and-so, he sinned against me. Well, now that church can rightfully say, well, we know he sinned. He repented of that sin. He confessed that sin. He's right before God. Now, what can he do to fix it with you? You see, in each case of repentance, wherever amendment is possible, it must be made with all individuals included. The attempt must be made. As a representative of Christ and the church, confession before the church must occur. In each case, whether it's an individual before God, or with a large group of individuals, confession of fault must always occur. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. They say the the first step to recovery is acceptance. Well, if you are indeed going to repent of your sin, you must admit to being wrong. You must confess that sin. Now, as we said, wherever possible, an attempt of restitution should be made. Under the law of Moses, we find in Exodus chapter 22, verse 1, that if a man shall steal an ox or sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore the five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. We find this also in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 and through 27 concept of restitution 
as well as Luke chapter 19, verse 8, where Zacchaeus points out that if he has wronged any man, he will repay it. Now, though we're not under the law of Moses, the principle remains important. If I go out and murder someone, I cannot bring that life back to that individual. Life cannot be restored to that person. However, let's say I killed a man. Did he leave behind a wife, perhaps some children? Though I cannot restore his destroyed life, could I not attempt to support her through financial means, his widow, or even help the children of this victim? I would be making restitution in that instance. You see, that home just lost its head. I am responsible for that. Therefore, if I am truly to repent of that sin, I must make proper restitution where possible. Theft. If I steal something, I should be able to return it. Or at least willing to. I know when I was in high school, I had stolen some trading cards from a guy I knew. Well, that following summer, I had obeyed the gospel. And I would realized what I had done was wrong. So I got those trading cards together. I had written a letter. And I had thankfully found out that one of our mutual friends was going to go see him. So I asked, hey, would you mind giving this note to this guy? Now, it would turn out that he rejected those cards. He, re he From my understanding, he, uh, he accepted my apology, but he didn't want the trading cards back. I had discharged my obligation of repentance. What about student loans? We hear a lot about that now recently. If I take out the debt, if I go to college, whose fault is that? That's mine. If I increase in debt, I owe that money back. And you can go with that, go about that regarding any other form of debt. You take out a credit card and you're not paying that debt back at all, you are sinning. You're stealing. Romans chapter 13 verse 8 says, to "Owe no man." Now not all forms of debt are sinful, but if you are Borrowing money without any intention on paying it back, you are stealing in that regard. What about adultery? Can a, a couple living in adultery scripturally remain together? But what if one or both of them become scripturally baptized for the mission of sins? Absolutely not. Because that baptism is not scriptural. They're not candidates for that baptism. They're still living in sin. Consider the world about us. How much of the world is living in adultery? And they take absolutely no thought of it. They would need to cease that adulterous union in order to truly repent. And at that point, they would be scriptural candidates for scriptural baptism. While it is possible to have our debts forgiven, as seen in Matthew chapter 18, verse 27, this must never be taken for granted. We must never reason that because I cannot repair all of my sins, all of my destruction, I therefore will make no attempt to remedy any of them. That's faulty reasoning. As students of the Bible, we are therefore forced to conclude that anything called repentance without the full complement of its corresponding elements that define the term is no repentance at all. It is merely fearing or feeling sorrow for committing the act. Now we ask another question. What must be done when someone truly does repent? Well, the, easy, the answer is easy. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. 
they must be forgiven. Now this morning we have discussed the different elements of biblical repentance by examining Luke chapter 3 verse 8. We must realize that true repentance must occur in order to be a candidate of baptism. Again, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. We must also realize that it is true repentance is a demonstration of one's faith in God as a Christian when we invoke what's typically called the second law of pardon. It's showing our faith in God. And I don't think many times we think about that. In both instances, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins once we comply with His terms. In the first, becoming a Christian. In the second, being restored as a Christian. We have discussed the terms of pardon this morning. As an alien sinner, hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of your sins, and confessing Christ before others. This puts you in the having the ability to be scripturally baptized. You're now a candidate. Or as a child of God, repentance and prayer. Confessing fault. Taking these steps makes you right before your creator. Above the different things we've discussed, the best way of providing restitution is to use our very lives in submission to God by buying back the time that we have wasted. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16, Colossians chapter 4 verse 5, and James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26. That passage points out that I should be able to show you my faith by my deeds. If I can't do that, I have a dead faith. Now, whatever your your need might be this morning, whether you need to become a Christian, or if you are a child of God and through process of time and weakness you have succumbed to temptation, you need to be restored. Please take the next few moments to correct that as together we stand and sing. <laughs> 